In that film, Rodrigo plays um, a warrior of sorts. He's a violent man, a slave trader, a greedy man, a selfish man. That happens right at the beginning of the film, and the rest of the movie is about the story of him seeking redemption, uh, finding God, and learning to love other people. It's a per story of personal transformation, but he goes from a misguided warrior uh, to what a warrior actually is. We've said as we started our curriculum this year that a warrior is one who fights against something and one who fights for something. And after looking at the first man, Adam, for three weeks now, we're going to take a step forward in, in Scripture to the next couple chapters, and we're looking at Adam's son today, his firstborn son, a man named Cain, who we're calling a misguided warrior. Let me read the story for you, Genesis chapter 4. There's 16 verses here, and it's a well-known story, but you may not know the details of the story. Let's, uh, let me read it for you. Adam made love to his wife Eve, and she became pregnant and gave birth to Cain. She said, with the help of the Lord, I have brought forth a man. Later she gave birth to his brother Abel. Now Abel kept flocks, and Cain worked the soil. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry, and his face was downcast. Then the Lord said to Cain, Why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let us go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain said to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land, and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth, and whoever finds me will kill me. But the Lord said to him, not so. Anyone who kills Cain will suffer vengeance seven times over. Then the Lord put a mark on Cain, so no one who found him would kill him. So Cain went out from the Lord's presence and lived in the land of Nod, east of Eden. Okay, fairly well-known story. At least many people think they know the story. Uh, even people who know very little about the Bible know roughly of Cain and Abel. And one of the most misquoted lines in the whole Bible is that one you heard right in the middle of the story, Am I my brother's keeper? I'll talk about that a little bit later. So here we are exactly one generation into the human race. We're one generation into the story, and we have murder. How did things go so south so fast? A little bit of review just to bring you up to speed. <clears throat> we say in the beginning of Genesis, God created the heavens and the earth and everything in them and every creature that walks and swims and flies on, on the earth. And then God creates humankind, man and woman, in his own image. The only creatures made in the image of God are the man and the woman. He makes them for each other. He puts them in the garden to enjoy it and care for it, to enjoy each other and enjoy him, their creator, in perfect relationship, perfect harmony. <clears throat> God gives one command. He says, you can eat from every tree in the garden. It's all yours to enjoy, except do not eat from the tree of the knowledge of good and evil in the center of the garden, because if you eat of that tree, you will surely die. God's enemy, the serpent, enters the picture and approaches with questions and a lie. He says, did God really say, did God really say this? He didn't really mean that. What he meant was this. And then when Eve saw the, uh, the fruit was uh, pleasing to the eye and good for food, she took some and ate, gave some to her husband, Adam, who was with her, and we see Adam's sin. Last week we covered Adam's sin of passivity, that he failed to recognize the enemy, he failed to engage the enemy, he failed to fight. He failed to fight for God's word, he failed to fight against the enemy, he failed to fight for the woman God had given him. Now we see two sons, Cain and Abel. The Bible only tells us that Cain worked the soil, in other words, he was a farmer, and Abel kept the flocks. He was more of a shepherd. And we see, first of all, that Cain was misguided by his selfishness, misguided by selfishness. Cain offers some of the fruits of the soil as an offering. Abel offers the fat portions from the firstborn of his flock. Now, the question here. Actually, let me read, uh, go back to the verse. The Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. Now, what's going on here? 
Uh, why does God look with favor on one son and without favor on the other son's offering? Uh, what did Cain do that was so wrong in God's eyes? What's going on here? Now, there are several possibilities, scholars tell us. First of all, it's possible that Cain offered the wrong type of offering to God, meaning uh, his offering did not include blood. Throughout the Old Testament, we see that the, uh, the, the verses say the life is in the blood. The sacrifices Israel was, requ was required to give to God for the forgiveness of their sins for atonement always involved blood sacrifice. Life was in the blood. In the New Testament, we read there is no forgiveness without the offering of blood, which is why uh, when Jesus came, he died uh, the sacrificial death on the cross so that his blood was spilled as the final and most perfect sacrifice to cover all of our sins. That's how God designed it. Without blood, there is no forgiveness. So it's possible that uh, Cain's offering did not measure up because it was just fruit. It was a grain or fruit offering. In Hebrews 11, we read, uh, By faith, Abel offered a more excellent sacrifice. So it's possible that the offering was supposed to be a blood offering. We don't have God's command. We don't have what he said to Cain and Abel. That Cain should have purchased, perhaps, an acceptable sacrifice from his brother, which he could have done. In those days, if you were a farmer and you didn't have uh, animals to sacrifice, you had to use your crops to go purchase a sacrifice to offer the appropriate sacrifice. So it's possible it was the wrong type of offering. Secondly, it's possible it was the wrong quality of offering. Notice it says, uh, Cain gave some of the fruits of his field, whereas Cain gave of the firstborn of his flock, the fat portions. It's possible that Cain did not bring the best of his produce, that maybe he brought the, he brought the, the rotted, bad-looking fruit to the Lord as a sacrifice. Maybe he dishonored God by bringing the wrong quality of that offering. Or thirdly, it's possible that there was something wrong with Cain's heart in offering the sacrifice. I was reminded, and I may have told this story here uh, over the years, but there was a story of a little boy and a teacher, maybe a third grader, and the little boy keeps getting out of his seat and pestering the other kids. His name is Billy. He just can't sit still. Teacher warns him again and again, Billy, sit in your chair, sit in your chair, sit in your chair. Finally, she says, Billy, you get out of that chair one more time. You've got to stay after school for detention. So Billy isn't happy, but he stays put. Isn't happy, but he stays put for 15 minutes, 20 minutes, then 30 minutes. His teacher's very happy. So she goes back and says to him, thank you, Billy, for staying in your chair. I knew you could do it. Billy looks up at her through clenched teeth and says, I may be sitting in this chair, but I'm standing in my heart, he says. Maybe Cain had a rebellious heart. Maybe Cain blatantly disobeyed God's command. We don't know for sure. Maybe he just begrudgingly obeyed. Okay, if you're going to make me, I'll give you some fruit, but here's what you're going to get. Maybe Cain just pretended to honor God. But the bottom line is, the least we can say is that Cain's offering was in some way selfish and self-serving. Secondly, we see that Cain is a misguided war warrior because he's misguided by his pride. By his pride. God looks favorably on Abel's offering, looks poorly on Cain's offering. So we see this. So Cain was very angry. His face was downcast. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do, not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you but you must rule over it. So why is Cain angry? Why is Cain down, his face downcast? Have you ever seen a child do this? Maybe one of your kids have the downcast face. We know what it looks like. No, you can't have that cookie before, before supper time. Or no, you can't uh, stay out all night with your friends because everybody else is doing it. That's the response of immaturity. It's the response of someone who does not get what they want to get and they're not happy about it. Face downcast. Cain was very angry. Why is he angry? Was he angry with God for not showing, for not showing a favor to his offering? Uh, did he think God had treated him poorly somehow? Was he think, did he think God had been unfair to him? Or was Cain angry with his brother Abel, his younger brother, because he had pleased God while he himself had failed to do so? I think probably both. I think he was angry at both God and his brother. I think Cain is angry because he feels humiliated by God. As men, most of us struggle with this. This is the way we tend to react when we feel disrespected, when we feel humiliated, when someone makes fun of us, when someone cuts us off in traffic. We feel belittled or disrespected in some way. We respond with anger. The real emotion is hurt. But what we respond with is anger because that's just what men do. Did you see the World Series game the other night? Uh, I'm watching the World Series game. Guy hits a home run. You know what happens. 
And um, as he's coming around third base, he thinks he sees the pitcher say something to him. Okay, then he looks up and he says something back to the pitcher. These are professional men. These are guys making millions of dollars. But he feels disrespect. They both feel disrespected because they don't hear what the other guy says. And they're like, you talking to me? You talking to me? What are you talking to me? You talking to me? And, and, and this big, they all start pouring out. They're going to have a big baseball fight. You know, they punch and grab each other. They just grab each other and hold on to each other and act like they're going to fight. Because they felt disrespected. It's the same thing here, right? Cain is angry because God is gushing over his younger brother's offering. That's a great offering. You please me. But, he, but he, his own offering is found unacceptable. Cain's face is downcast because he doesn't like what God's decided. He doesn't like that God has accepted his brother's offering, but not his. He doesn't like it, so he resents God. His face is downcast. He's angry. So what's the sin crouching at Cain's door? The sin is pride. Now, what is pride? We all know there's a kind of a good, acceptable form of pride, and there's a, a destructive, sinful form of pride. Good pride is kind of like satisfaction that comes with a job well done. As men, we know what that is. It's taking pride in your work. And that can be a good thing. We want our kids to take that kind of pride in their schoolwork or eventually their professional work. That's not a bad thing. However, sinful pride is that, that inflated opinion of oneself, self-importance, arrogance, the need to feel superior to others, this kind of pride eventually disregards God. And this kind of pride is what could be called the original sin. Remember where Satan came from? Lucifer, angel of light, became puffed up, became proud, put himself above God, wanted to be seated above God. And so it was cast down by his own pride. Pride says, I'm good. I don't need your help, God. I don't need you at all. I'll do it my way, thank you. I'm good. Pride. Cain became angry and his face downcast because he was proud. In his pride, he needed to feel superior. He resented being told his offering didn't measure up. And he resented his brother. Now notice here, God gives Cain a way to repent. He gives him a way out. He says, if you do what is right, will you not be accepted? He still has a way to make it right. God says, hey, you can have a do-over. Your offering was not appropriate for whatever reason, but I'll give you a do-over. You can make it right. And by the way, this is the appearance of the gospel in Genesis. Way back before Jesus ever came to the earth, we see the gospel embodied here. There is a way. God says, okay, you screwed up. In some ways, you are a screw-up. You're a proud man. You did what is wrong. But I've made a way for you to make it right. Admit your mistake. Repent. Turn from it and receive the grace I want to offer you, and we'll make it right. In his pride, Cain chooses not to do so. Cain chooses not to repent. repent. Rather, he chooses to kill his brother. Finally, Cain is misguided by rage. So thirdly, he's misguided by his rage. Anger, and we've talked about this probably almost every year of team, we talk about anger sooner or later, because anger, I think, is pretty much a universal issue, uh, particularly for us as men. We'll see it in a number of the warrior stories we look at this year through our curriculum. And there are, uh, as I see it, uh, two kinds of destructive anger. Rage and bitterness. Rage is the outward expression of anger that hurts others. And bitterness is the inward uh, hoarding of anger that hurts others and hurts oneself. Uh, I have two stories here, and some of you have been around the team for a long time will recognize both of them. I'll tell them back to back. My brother and I are different. My brother and I grew up in the same family. I'm the oldest. He's younger. Um, he's a pastor in Ohio now. And we had some, we were, were very close to this day, but we also had sibling rivalry growing up, as, as most brothers do. Um, my brother expressed anger outwardly, typically, and I did it the other way. And here's two stories. Once when we were about, I was probably about 14 or so. He was about 11. Uh, and I was at that time still physically bigger than he was and could dominate him in terms of athletic uh, e events and all that and made him furious that he couldn't beat me at stuff. So we were playing basketball one day and he's hyper competitive and he's trying to win and I, and I, and I, and I, and I beat him and he starts, we start arguing, you get, you get in a kind of a, a spat over basketball because I'm winning all the time. And he tries to physically get rough and so I grab him, push him up against these, this wall of railroad ties up behind our basket at home and I pinned him there with one arm because I was bigger and stronger than he was. That didn't last very long, but I, I pinned him up there and used my hand. And I, I just, I pinned him up there and I went like this to his face, just touched him. Like that, I went, I can do this anytime I want. <laughs> didn't hurt him, didn't hurt him, but I humiliated him and I let him go. 
And I walked away. I took about three steps. And he hit me in the back of the head with a rock. <laughs> Wing! Right in the back of the head. That was the way he did things. <laughs> Fast forward like 25 years. We got in another argument as adults. And I said to him, if you just wouldn't lose your temper, this wouldn't happen. He looked at me and said, don't you even pretend you don't have an anger problem too. He said, you've punished me with your silence for years, he said. And that opened up a whole new door because he was right. His problem with anger was it tended to leak out. My problem with anger is I held it in and I punished in a different way. Most of us have a problem with anger. It's terribly difficult emotion to control and to manage. Cain's struggle was rage. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. And while they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. Notice this. In one generation, sin grows from the sin of passivity, Adam's sin, failure to acknowledge and obey God's command, failure to recognize the lies of the enemy, failure to protect the woman, to the sin of murder in his son, fratricide. Look at the progression of sin within Cain. Selfishness, that seems harmless enough, selfishness. I mean, he gave God something. It wasn't like he didn't give him anything. To pride, he didn't accept correction. He thought he was too good to be corrected. He didn't need God or his brother to help him. To rage, he saw himself as a warrior. I'll take it into my own hands, but terribly misguided to murder. Selfishness, pride, rage, murder. The progression of sin. Next, notice Cain's lie and his lame excuse. Then the Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? See, God knows good and well where Abel is. You can't fool God. But he asks, he gives Cain a chance to repent. He gives Cain a chance to confess. He gives Cain a chance to be honest. Look what Cain says. I don't know. Am I my brother's keeper? And this is the misquoted line I hear often. People quote that line, am I my brother's keeper? Like it's the right thing to say. If you understand the context of the story, it's exactly the wrong thing to say. God says, yes, you are your brother's keeper. Jesus said, love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, and your neighbor as yourself. You are responsible for your brother. We are responsible for each other. We are each other's keepers. You don't get it. But I wonder where he got this. I wonder where he got the, the lie, the avoidance of responsibility. Remember? After Eve ate of the fruit, she gave some to Adam. Remember those four words? Who was with her. If we had continued that part of the story in chapter 3 in Genesis, we would have seen that God comes looking for Adam and Eve in the garden. He says, where are you, Adam? He gives Adam a chance to come out uh, because they're trying to hide from God. And then he asks Adam, have you eaten from the tree? Remember what Adam says? He says, the woman you put here with me gave it to me. Right? She gave me some of the fruit from the tree and I ate it. In other words, it's not my fault. It's not my fault, it's her fault. And by the way, it's kind of your fault, God, for giving me her. Right? You gave the woman to me. Just saying. See, Adam was all about excuses. I think it's possible that Cain learned this from his father. One uh, philosopher once said, uh, often he had seen the secret of the father revealed in the son. Those are frightening words. Finally, notice that Cain complains more about his punishment then he expresses regret about his sin. The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your bro brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops for you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Cain says to the Lord, my punishment is more than I can bear. Today you are driving me from the land and I will be hidden from your presence. I will be a restless wanderer on the earth. Whoever finds me will kill me. You see it? Even now, Cain is looking out for number one. You think he would dissolve into a bucket of tears and confession and repentance. When it dawns on him what he's done, he killed his brother. But no, Cain's more concerned with the inconvenience of the whole thing for himself. I'm going to be a wanderer. Somebody's going to want to kill me. Not a single word about his brother. Cain is proud. Cain is misguided. A misguided warrior fights against God, not for God. A misguided war, warrior fights only for himself and not for others. A true warrior fights for God, for God's word, and for others. Here's the questions today around the table. I have one to add, uh, to add at the end as well, so get out your pencil. You can write it down. First question is, was there sibling rivalry part of, was sibling rivalry part of your early family experience? If so, how? Do you have any good brother stories, brother-sister stories to tell? Where were you in the pecking order? 
Uh, do you relate to Cain and Abel in some sort of way? Secondly, Cain's rage seems to have been rooted in resentment. How does anger work in your own life? Are you an outward expressor? Are you an inward uh, sort of a hoarder of your anger? And what does it do in that regard? So talk about yourself. Uh, do you typically um, carry anger as bitterness or do you t express it outwardly as rage? And here's the third question. This may be a, not a discussion for your table necessarily, but a homework assignment for you personally. Um, God says to Cain, uh, sin is crouching at your door. You must overcome it. Sin is crouching at your door. He warns him about what's coming. Uh, if there's a sin crouching at your door, what is it? If there's a sin crouching at your door, personally, as a man, what is it? And how do you overcome it? That's a, that's a question for a homework assignment. So get some coffee, get a donut, talk. I'll wrap you up right before 7 o'clock. Bring me prayer requests if you have them. Thanks, guys.